Hey, welcome to That Is The Week. This is Keith Tier on my own today because Andrew Keane is on the East Coast visiting his daughter's university campus. So this is a solo effort, but with a difference. <clears throat> what we're going to do today is uh, simultaneously uh, host a Twitter space. The Twitter space is, um, if you go to K-T-E-A-R-E K -T -E -A -R -E on Twitter, you'll see a link to a live Twitter space which will allow you to join and, uh, if you want to, uh, ask questions. Um, um, maybe even the audio will come through. Let's see if that works. That's a bit of an experiment. This week, we are talking about venture capital. Um, the, that was the week newsletter this week. It's titled, Should VC Be Public? Uh, which is a, a question uh, begged, in a way, by uh, an editorial in this week's uh, The Information, where um, they, they hinted or rumored that Andreessen Horowitz might become a public company. Um, now, you know, if you understand who the information are, the information is, is uh, Jessica Lessin's uh, publication with a, a great team with consistently fantastic insights and writing based on lots and lots of Silicon Valley relationships. So this is not a publication that speculates, um, uh, at least not often. And when they write something, there's usually some underlying information backing it up. So when they write uh, this week that, uh, and uh, we can look at it, when they write this week that Andreessen Horowitz might go public, um, they make a number of points. Firstly, that uh, it's never really been possible for VC firms to go public because they're too small, but that a public listing would ex accelerate the expansion of A16Z that's been underway for the past three years that has led to them having now um, 70 staff, which is a 170% increase. And they go on to talk about how um, the precedent in private equity, Blackstone and others, KKR, Carlyle going public, proves that the markets will accept uh, asset holders or managers as public entities. Uh, and that it gives a whole new way for cash to flow to A16Z um, and allows A16Z to become what is called permanent or evergreen capital. Now, just to define some of these things, um, permanent capital is, is a, uh, used as a phrase in contrast to, um, to venture capital. Uh, the way venture capital works is funds... Uh, raise a capital uh, uh, takes you know a period of time. If you're if you're Andreessen Horowitz, it takes a few months. If you're a new venture capitalist and you're successful, it might take a couple of years. You raise money, and you start to deploy it in year one. And normally, the fund has an end. Uh, it's a closed end fund uh, defined normally as ten years, with one or two years extension where where needed. And then it's done, and all the proceeds are distributed. That's venture capital. And the, the results of the profit um, uh, exit the venture capital fund. 80% uh, of the profits go to the original investors, typically, and 20% go to the managers, typically. And then the balance sheet shows zero at the end when the fund closes. Permanent capital, on the other hand, is, is a different animal. It's when the venture capital firm um, raises capital by selling equity. Uh, it invests from balance sheet, that is to say, not from a fund, although it can, it can also structure that balance sheet money as a fund if it wants to. That's what um, I was part of in ADV in the UK. We, we took money onto our balance sheet and then we, we created a fund underneath the company that allowed other uh, parties to invest at the fund level. Um, so you, they could do that, but certainly at the top, there's a company with a balance sheet and the money comes from that balance sheet. That means that when profits are made from investing, the profits return to the balance sheet and are 100% retained uh, at the company level. 
and can be reinvested in new, uh, in new cohorts. Uh, so you can have funds that roll. They, go, they start, uh, they're not really even funds, companies that invest that have rolling capital. And after a certain amount of time, if they're successful, they'll be entirely self-funded and they can also use their balance sheet to raise debt or other instruments. So uh, clearly permanent capital is, is kind of interesting, especially in a scenario where you want to invest in long bets that take more than 10 years to mature. If you think about uh, Amazon these days, Amazon is um, you know, several decades into its life and is still growing. Uh, and its stock is still reflecting that growth. And if Kleiner Perkins, the original, uh, or one of the original investors, had been able to maintain its stake and reinvest its profits over and over again um, by staying in Amazon and little by little uh, selling to fund new cohorts, uh, Kleiner Perkins would be a very different animal today than it, than it currently is. So. In that sense, it isn't shocking that Andreessen Horowitz uh, might go public. It isn't shocking at all. In fact, one wonders why VC hasn't thought about this path before. Now, this, this news is um, allied to last week's news that Sequoia is restructuring its fund into a, um, what you could think of as a mega top company that is the holder of all the underlying assets, whether, whether funds or direct investments, it doesn't really matter. Um, but in Sequoia's case, they've said that they are not planning to go public. And, and so, you know, when you think about it, um, there's a lot in common between what Sequoia is doing and what it, it is implied that Andreessen might do. Um, which is that they're both putting in place a top company and the top company um, is, is the uh, ultimate uh, destination for any profits derived from, from uh, their investing activities. And, and because of that, the potential to reinvest rather than distribute becomes possible. In, in the case of uh, a public entity, the shareholders have a liquid asset sitting on top of those assets and can choose to buy or sell at any time. Um, so it's, uh, and, and, and by the way, also very important, the public can invest because it's a publicly listed entity. So the, the current rules that prevent ordinary investors from investing in early stage companies due to what's called the accredited investor rules, which are all pervasive globally, um, those rules don't apply because once you're a public entity, anyone can invest in you. And so the potential opens up for capital to flow into, into let's say, Andreessen Horowitz from, for example, Robin Hood investors, um, opening up billions of dollars of ordinary people's money to be invested in early stage venture but not in a, in a reckless way, but by putting money into the top performing fund managers, which of course would be fantastic uh, uh, for everyone involved. For, for the, they were really, the, only, the only losers really would be the middlemen, which is the money managers in endowments and pension funds and so on that would now have to compete for access with everybody, with, with, with everybody. Uh, so just, just my take, that would be a good thing. In the case of Sequoia, they, they, they've declared they're not going to go public, so entry into their top co will still be restricted to accredited investors and in practice to large um, fund allocators like pension funds and endowments. And there's an argument that that's okay because pension funds are managing ordinary people's money, uh, endowments are managing... Uh, educational institution and other money and family offices are managing legacy money normally. So, um, you know, Sequoia is, is uh, making a profit for those entities, but liquidity becomes subject to whatever Sequoia says it is. And so you don't have the benefits of the democratization of investing. Uh, neither do you have 
um, on-demand liquidity. So in both cases, the Sequoia model is what you could think of as a, a walled garden or a closed model, whereas the, the idea of a publicly listed fund um, uh, company, uh, I can keep using the word fund, we should get rid of that word, it's a publicly listed investment entity, uh, more like uh, Carlyle or BlackRock or, or the others that have taken the public path in private equity. That approach um, is, is, in my view, superior. Now, um, let, let, just to get some things straight, this is a rumor about Andreessen Horowitz, not a fact. I'm guessing that it's um, a well-researched rumor, so there, there probably is fire where, where there is smoke, um, and, and, and we have yet to see. Now, what, what could be driving this? What would be the, the thing that is, is driving um, this trend? Uh, we've talked a lot on That Was The Week about um, the changes in the venture capital ecosystem driven by um, the, the move towards uh, growth investors uh, investing at scale rapidly and earlier uh, than, than was traditionally the case. And here again, it's worth contextualizing uh, a little bit historically. Um, and, and to really understand this, you have to go back to the bubble bursting in 1999-2000, when for all intents and purposes, um, uh, in Silicon Valley, the next few years were called the nuclear winter. Uh, to all intents and purposes, venture capital stopped investing. Not, not entirely, but for the most part, risk was not, um, was not something to look forward to, but was something to run away from. And most of Sand Hill Road um, slowed down, significantly slowed down. By the time um, Michael Arrington and myself created Archimedes Labs in 2005, and TechCrunch was born um, a few months later in June 2005, um, it really was the case that as Web 2.0 began to grow and companies like YouTube and Pandora were born, um, those founders were coming to the TechCrunch house in Atherton and pitching, stood on sofas using laptops to an audience of angels. And there were very, very few investors in the room that were Sand Hill Road representatives because they literally weren't playing that aggressively. And into that vacuum came what today we know as the seed funds. People like Ron Conway at Silicon Valley Angel um, uh, was very aggressively started investing in that time frame. I remember Jeff Clavier now at Uncork began investing personally and then eventually created his first fund uh, known as SoftTech VC. Um, you, you've got a whole bunch of entrants. Why Combinator and 500 startups came to life shortly after that, and uh, a, a new early stage investing ecosystem was born, which today we can call the seed ecosystem. And it's quite distinct than, from the old venture capital that predated the bubble bursting. As that matured and companies were born, the most important being Facebook, growth investing was born. Um, when Yuri Milner from DST Capital in 2010 invested, I think if I'm remembering rightly, it was $100 million into Facebook at a valuation of $10 billion along with Microsoft. Um, that was the, the, the first evidence that gr a growth investor able to write a decent sized check, um, being less concerned about short term valuation and more concerned with long term outcomes could win deals against established venture capitalists and was very successful doing it. In 2010, that marks the starting point of the trend to growth investing. And growth investing is really risk-averse investing into what at the time it would be perceived as a sure thing. And again, is not really the same as venture capital. Um, and, and the history of growth investing is its own history, but it, it culminates um, in the more recent era with people like Fidelity and BlackRock uh, uh, and now Tiger Global, KOTU, Insight and others uh, playing the same game of aggressively investing and, and, and coming earlier and earlier, sometimes now in the A round of a company 
Um, so you really have two you know, brand new asset classes within venture, the seed asset class and the growth asset class. Andreessen and Sequoia are kind of uncomfortably sitting in the middle trying to spread their tentacles to both sides whilst playing each side and for the most part are looking more and more like growth investors and less and less like venture capitalists. And as the growth investors come earlier, venture capital, uh, you know, uh, defined as what it historically has been, ceases to exist. It's redefined as an entirely new thing. And uh, because, it, because the people who play that game well command enormous assets, in the case of Sequoia, $45 billion. Um, uh, I don't know the number for Andreessen, but it's a, a very significant number. The potential for them to stop being fund managers and become company owners with assets is real. And how they do that, whether they go public or create a top co like Sequoia or some other method, is an open question. What, what is really interesting is that path is not available to the average venture capital fund because it's simply too small to do it. And it's certainly not available at the seed stage. So taking a pause and standing back, um, these two developments by Sequoia and uh, Andreessen, if it's real, um, are not a surprise. Uh, is entirely consistent with what you would expect to happen uh, and, and almost certainly is the start of a trend um, uh, uh, which will evolve o over the coming period. So um, one, somebody in the, in the chat is asking how does going public impact LP structures? Um, thanks for that question, Julia. Well, LP structures simply go away in this scenario, but you still have, uh, when I say that, I mean, they're not LPs anymore. LP stands for limited partner. That means there's an LLC that they're a member of, um, and they have, sh they have uh, you know, units of ownership in that LLC, and they have a call on the returns from that LLC. In these structures, they become equity shareholders in a new entity. And as an equity shareholder, they don't have any um, preordained right to dividends or distributions of any kind. Their asset value is enshrined within the price uh, that the shares they hold um, command. And that price, of course, is a function of um, uh, the underlying asset's value and the, and the growth rate of the underlying assets, just, just like any company that's public is measured by two things. It, the, 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 the current um, value of the company usually measured in revenue, but it can also be measured in asset value. Um, and whatever the, the form of value that the entity owns, the absolute size of that is, is the baseline for valuation. And then the rate of growth it gives you an indication of the multiple that you might be able to attract to that value. And, and so if, you know, if your assets are growing 200% a year, um, then, then you're going to get a different valuation than if they're growing, let's say, 500% a year or 20% a year because uh, the multiple of your base value will, will be different because uh, the market always values the future, not just the present. So LPs go away and they become shareholders. Uh, now, as a shareholder... Uh, they can, they, you know, they, they basically keep 100% of their profit, uh, not, the, not 80%. They keep 100% of their profit, and their capital that they staked is, is their basis for continuing to keep that. And they don't just get 20%, they don't just get 100% of, the, of, of their profit, you know, in, in one cohort. It's permanent. They, if they keep holding the shares, they keep getting more and more. Um, so in that sense, it, it can certainly be modeled very beneficially to what would formerly have been an LP and is now an equity holder. At the same time, um, the fund itself uh, keeps 100% of its upside. Um, and so it can, when it makes exits, retain the capital 
and reinvest it in the next cohort, thus helping the equity shareholders as well. So as a structure, um, it, it, it does very well. Now, obviously from a tax point of view, it's treated differently. Um, uh, and I'm not a tax expert, so I'm not gonna deep dive into that, but certainly capital gains tax will be available to equity shareholders, long-term capital gains if they hold long enough. And um, it's possible that within a corporate structure, as an asset holder, um, uh, 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 profits derived from successful investments will be subject to corporate tax. Um, there may be ways that lawyers can figure out where it's also capital gains. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I'd say those are minor points in the big picture because the overall approach seems, seems very well. Um, so so let's, let's take a deep breath there and, and pause uh, just for a second. And... Uh, uh, ask uh, a second question, which is, um, if this is happening, and if venture capital is, um, is going to um, be at risk uh, because this approach will take over the industry, that's something that, for example, Sam Lessin has been arguing on his podcast and also in the information, that um, venture capital has to in a way, accept defeat and move to areas of focus that are not of interest to the big players. And so try to, um, if you like, game the system by surviving on the edges is the way I think of it. Um, I, I, I entirely understand that thought. Um, and it, you know, uh, certainly tactically can make sense for an individual fund to do that. Um, but if you're looking at this at the macro level as an ecosystem and an asset class, the question arises, what, what, you know, who's left standing uh, through this process? And um, uh, the, the, so the, the truth is that the seed asset class is left standing. Um, why? Well, because nobody, and I really mean nobody in the growth side, knows how to or would want to take the risk with seed stage investments. Um, being able to select from large numbers of uh, candidates a small number of investments is, is a specialist skill. Um, it, it can be very specialist, as in uh, a fund, a, a seed fund could focus, for example, on, on, um, on uh, biotech and is likely to be highly specialist in its ability to do that. It could focus on hard tech or deep tech, as it's sometimes called, and be very focused in its ability to do that. Uh, or it could be focused on SaaS, like, like um, say, Point Nine is in, in Europe, or um, Thomas, uh, Tomas Tungs uh, is here at uh, Red Point in the Valley, uh, and be really, really awesome at SaaS investing. So uh, the first thing about the seed stage is uh, there are specialists. There are also seed generalists who focus on team and market segment and uh, size of opportunity and likelihood of, of, get, of gaining um, outcomes. Um, I'd roughly divide those people into traction investors who, who go in early when there's signs of life in a product market fit and, um, you know, passion investors, people like Saul Klein at Local Globe uh, or Seed Camp, Reshma Sahoni and Carlos at Seed Camp, who are passion investors uh, who, who basically have conviction in a team and an idea and an outcome. There's a lot of those who uh, invest prior to traction and have had great success doing so, producing fantastically um, uh, successful companies like TransferWise or UiPath or Revolut and, and many, many others. So um, the seed stage is, is immune to being victimized by this, these trends. It, it will continue to survive and could even be the beneficiary of the large amounts of capital and the rapid deployment of capital happening um, from the Series A sometimes, but more commonly the Series B onwards. Um, and, and so the seed stage is really, really interesting. Now, the problem with the seed stage from a structure point of view is it can't really take advantage of these 
these new ways of organizing. Um, why? Because each seed fund is too small to be able to benefit or even successfully achieve public listings. There are exceptions. Um, a UK fund, uh, uh, I think it was Forward Partners, just, just went public after previously being funded as an LP by BlackRock. BlackRock then invested in them as an equity holder and, uh, and they are doing a listing. So there are, there are exceptions to this, but they tend to be smaller plays and um, a bit harder, for example, for institutions to deploy capital through them. Uh, although, you know, the, 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 the BlackRock uh, uh, Ford Partners example is, um, you know, shows that there's, possibili there's possibilities of, of a kind of a, a patron uh, artist relationship between institutional capital and a bunch of small funds. That, that's theoretically possible. I don't think that's going to happen. I think there's too much risk at the C stage for that to happen en masse. Um, so I think the C stage needs a different approach. Um, firstly, whenever there's a lot of high value assets, and uh, at this point it's, it's worth going to our tweet of the week this week to, to give some context. Um, tweet of the week is, um, is all about the seed stage. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting. So let's put it on screen and we can talk about it. Tweet of the week is uh, kicked off by Turner Novak asking whether any LPs have aggregated the recent performance uh, from seed funds um, for our emerging managers, which is an, another way of talking about early stage funds. And uh, Samir Kaji, who is well versed in the seed space, answers with uh, some examples of performance at the seed stage derived from, uh, I think mainly from um, pitch book. And uh, he makes the point that, you know, the, the top quartile uh, funds um, are doing somewhere between 2.2 uh, and 1.6x return, depending on which source you use, um, which is, you know, uh, when looked at from the point of view of what is called uh, internal rate of return, which is a measure of growth of value over time, um, it looks at uh, roughly around 30% IRR, uh, you know, a bit under 30% as an average. Obviously, more recent funds haven't yet matured enough to have a good IRR. Um, uh, VC funds have what's known as a J curve, where in the early years they're investing money. And so they don't have yet measurable upside. And then over 10 years, the J turns upwards and they get to some of these IRR numbers. So, um, so um, you know, he, he focuses on 2014 to 2018, where it looks like the average is, I don't know, 27 or something like that. Um, Terence Rohan replies to that, saying that for a sub 50 million fund, uh, which isn't really tracked by research houses, you can assume that a good fund in the top decile is doing, um, the, uh, uh, you know, for every year of its life, the multiple of its 50 million is, is the year number. So in year one, it's one times, in year two, two times, in year two, three, three times. And ultimately, he thinks five to 10x is top decile for sub $50 million funds. Um, Reshma Sahoni, who knows because she runs one, says this is absolutely right and doable over and over again. Now, you know, what that tells you is that the seed stage asset class produces exceptional returns in the top D style. Um, not news to me. Um, uh, when I was at ADV, uh, not to disclose any, any confidentialities, but we invested uh, in a partnership with SeedCamp, uh, a small amount of money actually, but it, uh, the, the returns uh, for that small amount of money over the period of time, which was roughly three years, uh, actually far exceeds that uh, 10x that, um, that, that Reshma spoke about, and, and that was in three years. So 
The seed asset class, if properly understood in its differential, that is to say, you know, if you create 10 segments, um, each segment uh, is ranked by performance, and you look at the top segment by performance, the returns are, are exceptional and the gross amounts are very large. Now that's where the question of what to do in the seed area becomes actionable. The, the top performing seed managers collectively have market power, have a track record, and have a weight of investments sufficient to attract institutional capital, although they can't do so individually because they're too small. Um, it's interesting, uh, one of the things in this week's newsletter is um, our good friend uh, Paul Graham. And Paul Graham comments that um, the top value 30 YC companies, uh, uh, the value of the top 30 YC companies is currently $575 billion. That's the top 30. And um, you know, that is a, a sign of the value that can create, be created from a seed starting point. Now, Y Combinator typically owns 7% of a company at birth. Um, when it puts its uh, first money in. And, you know, 7% of 575 billion is just under 50 billion. And um, Y Combinator hasn't, um, hasn't, you know, maintained its ownership and doesn't have 50-ish billion of value in those companies, those top 30 companies, because it's been diluted through successive rounds down to a much smaller percentage. Uh, still outstanding, by the way. But if it did have the capital, um, it would have 50 billion if it maintained. And, you know, that begs the question, why doesn't it have the capital? Because why Combinator is, is clearly, as is the entire top D side of the seed asset class, is entirely um, um, capable of making good use of unlimited amounts of capital as companies grow and prosper. So that, that is another clue as to uh, why the seed stage is interesting and how it might be um, smart to think about it. I personally think that the aggregate value of the top performing seed managers is going to be, become uh, an organized asset class open to institutional capital at scale. And um, I think the best thing to say is watch this space and let's see how that evolves over time. Let's wrap up with uh, this week's Startup of the Week. Uh, the Startup of the Week is, um, is, is driven by the fact that, um, and let me go to the end to make sure that we're in the right place. The Startup of the Week is, um, is Bitcoin. Why? Because uh, this week marks 13 years since Bitcoin white paper was released. And today, uh, as we, as we can uh, see if we, if we uh, take a look, Bitcoin's market cap, I think I can do it by just putting BTC. Yeah, there we go. Bitcoin's market cap currently is, um, is uh, measured against 60,000 or close to $61,000 a share. It's uh, well over a trillion dollars. Um, um, 13 years later. And, you know, I don't think there's any company in the world that was worth a trillion dollars um, after 13 years. So that would make Bitcoin, uh, there you go, 1.16 trillion. Uh, oh, it's, it's come down, 1.274 trillion. Still, no company has reached a trillion dollars of market cap in anything like that time frame. In the past, it would have been really outstanding to reach a billion dollars of market cap in that time frame for, for a corporation. So Bitcoin is the fastest growing asset in the history of companies, if it was a company, but it isn't a company. It's a protocol and a platform that is open source and the whole world can participate in. That, it seems to me, is uh, quite a good startup of the week in 
a week where it is rumored that Andreessen Horowitz will become uh, an openly investable entity with a public listing where everyone in the world can put money into it. And if it does do that, uh, I, for one, will add it to my portfolio as, as um, I do think that uh, it will do very, very well for its investors. So that, my friends, is uh, this week's That Was a Week without our good friend Andrew. Should venture capital be public? My answer is yes, uh, but there's lots of devil in the details there. And I will see you next week uh, with Andrew on That Was the Week. Bye for now. See you soon.